Good morning, welcome. I'm Ellen Honigstock, Senior Director of Education at Urban Green Council. Welcome to today's event about waste heat energy recovery technologies. We'd like to thank Con Ed for sponsoring this event. Um, Urban Green's values are excellence, inclusion, collaboration, and engagement. We invite you to be mindful of these during the program, both when you're listening in and asking questions. So first, I'd like to introduce Sean Hoyt, Section Manager, Clean Energy Networks at Con Ed, who's been a great partner to Urban Green over the years. Thank you, Ellen, and, and welcome, everyone. Uh, apologies for no camera. There's technical difficulties, but wanted to make sure that we started on time. Um, we are good partners with Urban Green, and we want to thank you for your support and bringing this critical topic to the table today. So a little bit about Con Edison. This year, we'll be celebrating our 200th birthday. It was founded in 1823 as the New York Light, New York Gas Light Company. Uh, our role has changed over time, but our primary focus is still to provide safe and reliable energy to our customers in New York City and Westchester County. To date, we have three commodities, electric, steam, and gas, and we have a very diverse customer market segment that spans anything from large commercial industrial customers, such as the Empire State Building, to small commercial industrial customers like coffee shops and bodegas. We also serve multifamily buildings and residential homeowners. Our growth strategy is about investing $1.5 billion in energy efficiency and heating electrification as an interim target by 2025. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a bit. And we really want to make sure that for all of our customers that we are a trusted energy advisor. We want to make sure that we're promoting customer choice, education, and incentives. So a little bit more about our clean energy commitment, which is our pledge to transform our business and support the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act goals and others in New York City, and includes the numbers of separate pledges on our end from building an electric grid that will deliver 100% clean power by 2040, to supporting building electrification, electric vehicles, and decarbonizing the gas system. I wanna primarily focus on, on two of these pillars that we have. Pillar two, which is really geared towards empowering all of our customers to meet their climate-related goals by accelerating energy efficiency with deep retrofits, aiming to electrify the majority of building heating systems by 2050, and again, all in on electric vehicles. In 2022, we spent $500 million on energy efficiency programs, and that's just in one year. And recently, we surpassed 100 million megawatt hours of energy savings for our small and medium business customers. The second pillar I'd like to focus on is Pillar 5 which is geared towards partnering with all of our stakeholders. Under Pillar 5, which is very important, we look to enhance our collaboration with our customers and stakeholders to improve the quality of life of the neighborhoods we serve and live in, with a primary focus on disadvantaged communities. We need to make sure that during this energy transition that it works for everybody, and education and outreach are really big parts of that. Last year, we successfully hit a target on our clean heat program, which is designed to electrify heating loads in the winter time. We just relaunched the program as of January 17th of this year, and we're actively accepting applications to help our residential and commercial customers move away from fossil fuel fired heating and domestic hot water systems from their facilities and homes. Nationally, Transportation is the largest emitter of carbon emissions, but in New York City, buildings, not vehicles, are the leading source. There are a number of local and state laws that are requiring our customers to meet certain guidelines and reductions by certain dates and times, and we know that for our customers, this could sometimes be daunting. We want you to know that we are here to help, and we're working with our customers to help them meet their goals, even the goals that they're not aware of right now, as it pertains to new heating solutions such as heat pump technologies. Under my section, which is Clean Energy Networks, we focus on widespread cross-sector collaboration that really helps ensure that our clean energy solutions are creative, coherent, and integrated enough to tackle New York's most challenging problems. 
For this effort, we focus on industry partnerships like the one with Urban Green Council to help our customers have the access to tools and resources they need to make informed decisions about their energy needs. And also to connect them with a network of qualified partners that can help them identify and meet their goals as well. Under market transformation, we partner with our contractors, we partner with our mark, um, manufacturers, distributors, and a number of other partners to really rely on their expertise in areas such as HVAC, the heat pump technologies that we'll be talking about a little bit later, um, anything from lighting and controls, and anything that you could think of that would help you become a more sustainable part of the New York State ecosystem. The company is also helping New York meet its urgent need for clean energy workers by investing in green job training. And I'd like to really acknowledge the Clean Energy Academy that we have launched with Wildan, funded by NYSERDA, that has just surpassed 500 individuals that have graduated from the program and are entering the career in the clean energy field. We also have clean heat financing options for customers that cannot afford to move forward with clean heat technologies, even with our incentive program. This financing program is, is um, available to all customers that are looking to install heat pump technologies and some of the technologies that we'll be providing you with information on today as part of the decarbonization efforts. And last but not least, I focus on bringing cutting edge technologies to the market. When Sylvia, who will be introduced shortly, brought a wastewater heat recovery technology to our attention as a viable solution for our customers, our energy efficiency department was actively engaged and evaluating opportunities to have this technology implemented in our service territory. Waste energy prevent, presents a massive opportunity for building owners that are trying to improve their energy performance and reduce carbon emissions. According to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, it estimates about two thirds of energy produced in the United States is wasted yearly. This is a huge opportunity for us to really take advantage of the opportunity in front of us. And we know that for our customers, this is a journey and a journey that may not start today. But we want you to know that we're here to support whether it's through energy services and planning for different types of solutions, whether it's electric vehicle charging or energy storage technology. For our trade allies, we want you to know that we're opening up your business opportunities. We want to become better partners with you and make sure that we take full advantage of the services that you could offer to the communities in which that we serve. For those of you looking to enter the clean energy workforce, as mentioned, the Clean Energy Academy is a, is a perfect start to your new career. And for our industry partners, such as the Urban Green Council, we look forward to continuing to partner with you and working with you with the critical role that you play with this transition. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague that will take us on to the next part of the program, Sylvia Curran. Well, thank you so much, Sean, for the great introduction. Thank you, Urban Green Council, for this platform. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sylvia Curran. I serve as a project manager in Con Edison Research Development, where I lead various clean energy innovation projects. I work with cutting edge technology and innovative solution in commercial and pre-commercial stage and supporting their market adaption by providing technical expertise to advance the development and interact with partners like Sean in energy efficiency to facilitate the first of its kind demonstration and de-risk the first um, of its kind of demonstration and accelerate the uh, adaption to our market for the clean solutions like you're gonna hear about today. So we are definitely technology agnostic and this is why we prepare the platform of really experts who will be showcasing their technologies. Um, we open to any innovative solutions and I keep pulse on market in energy industry across the globe and partner often with um, not only tech providers, but utilities, academia, and national lab. So like Sean mentioned, heat energy accounts for a large share of total energy demand and it's crucial for um, successful energy transition. Sewer heat exchangers use the heat from wastewater in the sewer to make it usable by building services. It's really energy that you paid for at some point and it's being dumped in a drain and we are offering solution that it could be reused and recycled. This means no fossil fuels 
are burned and the CO2 emissions is safe, and which is all contributing to New York City and New York State clean energy goals. So in addition to existing system heat sources, heat sinks of building can be intelligently reused, providing customer with non-fossil decarbonization solution with high energy savings and conventional heating systems and generate energy from waste heat is also a good way to reduce your own CO2 footprint. So now large businesses such as yours, high tech operations and data center and governments are all exploring innovation technologies that captures and reuse this vast, really could be called renewable energy source. So I'm excited to welcome you to our discussion with experts in this field, in the field of heat energy recovery, and they will showcase the product and solution that can be installed today in your buildings. Um, we will have five panelists today um, from Shark Energy System, Brock Trimble, from Noventa, um, um, Stephen Condi. Um, Maxi Term will be represented by Patrick Lack, Renewable Resource Recovery Corporation, or R3C, Carl Newbert. And last but not least, from Urig, we will have Christian von Drachenfeld. I hope I pronounced that right. So these panelists, in a short um, minute, will start the, the discussion. They will all have five minutes. They will um, provide five, three slides, market technology overview of the product they showcase. They will give you understanding where is it currently installed or what is ideal market for it. And they will summarize the value proposition and benefits for you. Um, we will go in the order how the panelists are displayed. And um, between the five minutes, I will have a little bit of discussion. And at the end, we will have a plenty of time for Q&A. Feel free to submit your questions in uh, in the chat and Q&A um, um, field, and we will address them at the end. Feel free to type it in as you have it, and we will definitely have time for, uh, we will allocate it 30 minutes for Q&A. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Brock Trimble from Shark Energy and just to showcase his technology. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brock Trimble. I'm the Director of Technical Sales for Shark Energy Systems. Uh, we are a Canadian company founded and operated uh, just outside of Vancouver, BC in the Pacific Northwest. Um, next slide. As you can see here, we offer two sort of separate and distinct solutions for wastewater energy recovery systems uh, based on sort of operation size and scale. So the first that you're going to see here is the shark system. This is a wastewater filtration device that allows access to the energy contained within wastewater by temporarily uh, filtering the solids content and discarding it to the sewer and using that uh, really energy rich wastewater stream uh, to move into your, your building space using a uh, paired plate and frame heat exchanger, allowing that energy transfer to or from your system. So with this, we're able to effectively uh, move uh, heat to, uh, sorry, allow the wastewater source to become a heat source or a heat sink. Uh, heating or cooling your building space. And that uh, heat exchanger can be customized for your project based on flow rates, delta Ts, approach values, uh, et cetera. Uh, on the smaller side, we have the Piranha uh, piece of equipment, which itself is a very specialized and dedicated wastewater source heat pump. So with this unit, we're actively uh, recovering energy and taking uh, basically every BTU that's available in that wastewater stream uh, down to a certain low limit and uh, using this energy to transfer into a domestic or a hot water stream, uh, providing hot water at a set point uh, directly into your building space. Both of these options uh, have multiple sizes uh, for scalability, uh, whether they be on the smaller end or scale, you know, anywhere from uh, about 100 gallons a minute up to about uh, 2,500 gallons a minute of wastewater flow and filtration uh, with the shark unit, and then multiple uh, heat output capacities with the piranha. Uh, everything is very, very scalable for your systems. Uh, and everything also has a relatively small footprint, uh, completely sealed where they're insulated, uh, sorry, installed. So they have no odor, uh, which is fantastic when it comes to wastewater uh, source <laughs> systems. Next slide, please. And for sort of assistance in seeing uh, 
how these these systems are built into your uh, your applications, the Shark system is really well designed for those larger applications. Um, when we look at this, we look at medium to large scale multifamily residential. So we look at very large buildings or multi-phase build outs. And a perfect example of this is the 700 uh, unit multifamily res residential project called Wall Center Central Park in Vancouver, BC, as well as medium to large scale commercial and industrial. A perfect example uh, for office space is the DC Water Headquarters in Washington, DC. This is using a shark for both heating and cooling uh, of their office space. And finally, looking at the largest types of systems, district heating and cooling networks, uh, a system uh, example is the False Creek Neighborhood Energy Utility, a district uh, heating network in Vancouver, BC. When we look at the smaller options, the Piranha is really well designed for individual buildings. By this, we typically mean small to medium multifamily residential. A great example is the 37 unit multifamily project in Boulder, Colorado called 3200 Bluff, as well as small to medium commercial and industrial uh, projects like a hotel laundry uh, up in the Rocky Mountains of Canada, uh, the Lake Louise Inn uh, in Alberta. And last slide, please. So we've looked at the how and where, uh, but why? Why wastewater? Well, as Sylvia mentioned, it's a recoverable and renewable form of energy. Everyone uses hot water throughout the day and it's all thrown away uh, down our sewer system. So by harnessing this, we can recover it and re uh, reuse that energy uh, over and over again within your building space. That wastewater discharge is also a very consistent temperature throughout the year because it's often thrown away uh, roughly at the same temperature, regardless of geographic location or seasonality. So because of this, wastewater really becomes essentially a limitless source material. It's always flowing out of our buildings beneath our feet and ready uh, and waiting to be captured. So by utilizing wastewater, we're able to realize uh, reductions in energy losses from buildings, stopping that energy from being thrown away, as well as improving the energy use within your buildings, reducing your EUI, as well as in many cases, operational costs. And by doing so, we can really reduce those GHG emissions that would otherwise be burned with fossil fuel uh, appliances. There's also a lot of regional support, things like local law 97 uh, in New York City, which are demanding carbon reduction, as well as uh, state and federal funding. Uh, an example is the Thermal Energy Networks and Jobs Act, um, as well as ut uh, utility incentives Con Edison, of course, uh, is, is supplying their clean heat programs. So all of these things are, are bringing to the forefront that market demand for high efficiency electrification, recoverable energy. And this is what's leading towards, uh, as Sean mentioned, heat pumps, using these forms of energy, reusing energy that's available, uh, and really driving forward this decarbonization and electrification effort. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Brag. And um, for the audience, our shark really have a wastewater heat pump. It, this is the only heat pump we're actually talking about today. So um, I hope you all pay attention when he mentioned that it's um, performance is independent of the ambient temperature. So all the pain point that electric heat pump are currently facing with degradation of performance at the cold temperature, uh, shark heat pump does not face that. So more on that during the conversation. Um, I'd like to introduce Stefan Condi from Noventa. Um, Stephen, is it Stephen or Stefan? Yeah. Stephen. Stephen, Thank, thank you, Sylvia, sorry. and, and uh, thank good you. morning, Please everyone. Uh, I'm Stephen Condi. I'm the Chief Technology Officer and Head of Operations here at Noventa. Uh, we're a renewable energy developer that has the exclusive distribution license for the Hoover Thermwind system. Hoover is a 150 year old wastewater company and they turned their minds to this uh, thermwind system and we'll walk you through it in a sec, but turned their minds to wastewater uh, heat recovery uh, about 15 years ago uh, and have a number of installations in Europe and North America. And simplistically how it works is we, we identify sewers uh, in, in the street allowance or on, on private lands. We tie in around the five o'clock mark into the sewer and we gravity feed into the first component called the ROK4. Uh, this is a perforated screen basket that holds back all the large solids, but allows the water and small particulate to flow through into the bottom of the wet well. The inside that shaft and inside that basket is an auger system that moves all of the, uh, all of the solids up to the top of the shaft. And then it's a gravity feed of all that solid component right back into the wastewater. And Hoover's philosophy in this was separate the solids, the stuff that's hard to pump first, and then look at what, what you can do to pump that afterwards. So now that we've got cleaner wastewater to pump, 
we pump it up into the uh, uh, completely sealed shell and tube row and heat exchanger. Uh, it's a self-cleaning heat exchanger. We actually put the wastewater through the shell side and we connect into a heat pump through the tube bundle. Uh, once we extract that heat out of the wastewater or reject heat back in to provide cooling to the building, all that wastewater goes right back to that first component at the top of the ROK4, resuspends all the particulate that we've sorted out and dumps everything right back into the sewer. With that ROK4, it's a, a fairly robust component. It's sold to municipalities for lift stations when they need large sewer conveyance uh, distances. Uh, the Rowan heat exchanger, they've got over 40 installations, uh, one of which being at the American Geophysical Union in Washington, DC, as well as a number of projects uh, throughout Germany, Sweden, Poland, uh, Switzerland, and soon to be again in Scotland and the UK. Uh, the benefit to the self-cleaning mechanism is it, it uh, prevents any uh, solids build up inside the heat exchanger. So they've developed a carriage that goes across and mechanically scrapes the outside of the tubes in the tube bundle heat exchanger. Once all that cleaning happens, all the particulate that's been pumped into the heat exchanger, plus all the, the biofilm that builds up on the, the energy transfer surface area, it moves across the bottom of the heat exchanger with another screw. All of these motors are fractional horsepower motors and only run for a few, uh, few minutes a day. Uh, next slide. And the target applications that we at Noventa as an energy developer look at, uh, we look at typically larger energy users. We're looking at hospitals, data centers, university campuses, hotels, district systems. Our first project here in Toronto uh, is going to be a 19 megawatt uh, heating and cooling supply to a hospital with two additional phases that are currently in design. Uh, the second phase will bring it up to about 40 megawatts of thermal energy, and then the third phase will bring it up to about 60 megawatts. In this application, and, and since this is what we're all talking about is greenhouse gas reductions, in our first phase, we're looking at reducing the hospital's carbon footprint by 8,400 tons a year, as well as because we're providing that cooling aspect and we're able to offset cooling towers by using wastewater and, and rejecting heat back to the sewer, we're offsetting over 43,000 cubic meters of water which I believe is roughly around 19 Olympic sized swimming pools each year. Uh, what Noventa offered to the hospital in this case is we funded the entire project. It's a $43 million project uh, and we work with them as energy as a service. As we build out to the subsequent phases, we'll see over 20,000 tons of CO2 reduction out of the hospital, effectively making it one of the first net zero hospitals in Canada. Uh, next slide. So what Noventa offers and some of the value proposition that we, we provide, since we're not the manufacturer of the technology, uh, Uber actually manufactures the system, we're energy developers, but we'll do a full design, build, finance, own, operate, maintain of these systems or any one of those letters. If you want us to help you design a system or help you design and help manage the build of it, we can do that. If it's just the design, build, finance, we can also... Uh, uh, facilitate that where you would retain ownership of the system. And we can also just provide maintenance and, and sell, uh, do an engineered sale of equipment. As it is a heat exchanger, we work very closely with you to make sure that you get the right heat exchanger selected, the right sizing, the number of uh, uh, heat exchangers that need to, to be connected. We work with you to design the connection into the sewer as well as that's always a challenge. Uh, but what we ultimately offer for a lot of the clients is a no upfront cost solution which is we will cover all the costs with going back to the Toronto Western Hospital, $43 million, they save $600,000 a year in energy costs and uh, they, they paid nothing up front. So we offer that as a, a, a full solution. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. This was very informative. As you can see, this is a very fancy heat exchanger that takes the advantage of free BTU in your sewer system. Installation doesn't seem that complicated and they have a very interesting financing model and up to 60 megawatt installation coming up. So I'm sure there'll be some questions about that. Thank you for that. Um, we will move now to MaxiTerm. MaxiTerms is actually a very interesting solution for Steam customers. If we have anybody here with their Steam system or district Steam, it's a complete innovative steam solution for industrial processing and hydronic hot water. 
domestic hot water, clean steam, and clean quality control. So I'll let Patrick Lack to do his part. Thank you, Patrick. Are you unmuted, if you can unmute yourself. Okay. Oh, good. Uh, I think you need to unleash my camera also. Am I wrong? There we go. There you go. Hello, welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Sylvia, for that nice intro. Um, yes, Maxiterm is located in Montreal, Canada. Uh, since 2005 in the U.S., we're a family-owned business uh, founded by my father uh, years ago. And uh, now it's me, my cousin, uh, my brother, and we have also American shareholders as well. We're working on our seventh patent right now. And uh, maxi term is uh, all about steam. If there's no steam, there's no maxi term. We don't generate steam. We use steam in a different way than the others to heat the hot water, whether it's a hot water loop for building heat or domestic hot water, process water. And we do have other um, product line for clean steam generation and steam quality control, like Sylvia mentioned. This picture is was taken on a short video that you can find on our YouTube channel. It's about two minutes. I invite you to go uh, watch uh, this animated video. And there's other videos also giving more explanation today. I need to be very short, so I'll do my best. So uh, let's take let, let's talk about uh, New York City itself. It has a huge district energy. I think over twelve hundred customers tied to the steam um, distribution system. If I remember correctly, uh, the steam pressure coming in the building is one seventy five psi uh, around that. All of them are reducing the steam pressure at ten. And then they're dumping condensate to drain. And to dump the condensate to drain, uh, they need to cool it down at 140, injecting fresh water all the time, which you are uh, in, in voice for, for that use of um, fresh water. In our case, uh, we can use directly high pressure steam coming from the grid, 175 PSI steam. So no more pressure reducing valve creating uh, he, uh, more heat because there's super heat generated after a PRV. I went, I did a lot of walkthroughs over years in different buildings in New York, and some of them is pretty hot in that mechanical room, mo mostly because of the PRVs, uh, pressure reducing valve. So we don't need those. We're coming at 175 directly on top. We have installed, by the way, at the American National Museum, uh, uh, North Shore Hospital in Long Island, uh, Vassar Hospital, not too far away of New York City and Pepsi-Cola also uh, nearby uh, New York. Uh, so where I was going at, and just depending on your temperature set point on the hot water side, let's say 120 Fahrenheit set point, which is a big trend right now with heat pumps and other application to go low temperature set point, we can do the same. And while we do so, we can dump condensate under 130 Fahrenheit during all operation, which means no fresh water needed. As you can see on this, control valve is on the condensate. So when the valve is modulating, we're playing with the heat surface area, the condensate level will vary during all operation. No water hammer, no, no bamming, no such thing. It's a very, very smooth operation. And the only moving part, it's a half inch control valve up to 10 million BTU. So easy fix, very low maintenance. Uh, and uh, by doing so, we generate energy savings, which I will show you, uh, explain to you in the next two slides. Next slide. So this is a real case study at Two Liberty Place, downtown Philadelphia. It's a iconic building. They're tied to the steam loop, a steam district energy loop. So in this picture, this is our uh, um, touchscreen, very uh, user-friendly uh, interface. Uh, so may, um, Operation is, is quite easy. We offer remote access also from Montreal for better customer support. We have also great local representative in New York City, which Lawrence Lowy and Adirondack Combustion for the rest of the state. Now with that service tech and everything. If you look at this picture, I wanna pay your attention on the temperature set point, which is 120 Fahrenheit, which is the big trend now to go low temperature set point on the hot water loop for building heat. If you look at the temperature return on the bottom left side of the touchscreen, it's 107 Fahrenheit. Now, if you look a little bit higher, the temperature discharge of the condensate is 110. Only three Fahrenheit difference with the temperature discharge. So no quencher is needed. 
right? So quick things that you see on the screen, we see the actual GPM uh, going through the heater and the actual BTU per hour. You can pull out trends, see how the system is working. Very good for troubleshooting. So again, go on YouTube channel. You'll find more info on everything. Next slide, please. Okay, you can click them all, please, uh, Anushka. <laughs> Sorry for that. So there's two uh, different options that we see in buildings, hospital, universities, or factories. So the number one application we do the most is BH, which is called for building heat. So hydronic closed loop, hot water loop. So let's say we're controlling 120 Fahrenheit set point with a potential return at 90. That means condensate can leave at 130. In the example, number two, domestic hot water, 40 to 140. And condensate can leave at 70 Fahrenheit. So in your conventional system typically you will work around six psi because even if you're reducing the pressure between 15 and 10 you will never have 10 and the heat exchanger you'll have a pressure drop to your steam control valve so let's assume at full load you will need for 4 million btu process just as an example you will need 4171 pounds per hour of steam top right and then if we go with our system at 175 PSI from Con Edison with 120 Fahrenheit set point and condensate leaving at 130 Fahrenheit for 4 million BTU process, you will generate 12.3% energy savings. On domestic hot water, because we'll dump condensate at 70 Fahrenheit, we're extracting more heat in each pound of steam, which is a sensible heat site. It's a big number, 16.9% energy savings when we'll be at full load. The other benefits around this, so no quencher is needed upon hot water temperature set point, of course. So if your temperature set point is 180 and temperature is 160, well, there's no way condensate will be dumping at 140, right? So it's all depend on your temperature set point, not necessarily the steam pressure. No vents to the roof or the wall. So that I cannot explain because we're running out of time, but there's absolutely no vents needed. The whole system will be stemmed for high pressure vessel based on the last safety valve on Con Edison or whatever steam loop you are. No on-site combustion using the steam district energy. Steam is safe and reliable. I mean, everybody walk in New York City, you will see those big cones on metal, steam blowing off, nothing to repair, nothing to be scared about. If it's a natural gas leak, everybody out of the building. Very quiet operation. This is no joke. You won't hear nothing. No overheat generated with pressure reducing valves. One moving part, very low maintenance costs, low footprint, fully automatic control system, just a click of a button to start the system, no manual assistant, user-friendly touchscreen with BTU energy readings and remote access for fast technical support. So I think I made it in five minutes, did I? You did. Good. All right. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank, you Thank you so much, Patrick. So a few corrections and just clarification. We enter steam around 150 psi district steam. Con okay. Edison does own one of the largest steam system. We have we serve three million new New Yorkers. We have over 1,500 customers. We operate on average pressure about 150. And uh, some of the benefit I'm going to highlight that Patrick mentioned, obviously no quenching is a cost avoidance for customers. If the condensate is too hot to dump it and you need to spend energy to quenching, here is the energy recovery part. And the other unique part about um, maxi term is that they really deep dive into thermodynamics. They utilize heat exchanger that is flooded to extract both latent and sensible heat. And I'll leave it at that point for all the thermodynamic fanatics like me. We know what we're talking about, but it's a great um, operation. They modulate condensate site, not the steam site. So they're always full of steam uh, pressure. So great solution for steam district steam customers or those who generate steam on site to avoid uh, its water conservation, energy conservation, and to avoid um, the uh, quenching cost. So um, thank, thank you, you Patrick. Yes. And I would like to now welcome Carl Newbert uh, from Renewable Resource Recovery Corporation. Call is going to move us into the world of both behind meter and in front of the meter application. And we're going to start going from the micro to macro application. So, Carl, please take it away. Yes. 
Good morning. My name is Karan Hubert. I'm the uh, VP Marketing and a Director of Renewable Resource Recovery Corp. We are a 14-year-old technology licensing firm based in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. Can we have the first slide, please? The um, AdSource Energy System has uh, two components that can function standalone or together as a renewable energy system. Below ground, we have the AdSource Energy Pipe, which is a precast concrete sewage pipe, a unique HTPE heat exchanger embedded within the walls of the pipe. This low cost solution allows the entire surface area of a sewage pipe to be used for geo exchange. In, in other words, we have a thermal battery where we can store and uh, recover energy from. Connecting the HTPE heat exchanger between contiguous sections of pipe can form a district heating energy system. During warm weather, heat is moved from a building by a ground source heat pump to the pipe and surrounding ground. During cold weather, heat is recovered from the pipe, its surrounding ground and the effluent passing through the switch pipe is upgraded by the heat pump within the building. The above ground uh, component is the ad source energy panel or ad source energy wall. It's a hybrid thermal and electric PV panel that recovers heat generated by PV modules. Recovered heat can be stored in the ad source energy pipes or used to provide domestic hot water. Electricity can be used to run the heat pumps or stored for whenever it is required. Next slide, please. The uh, ideal market uh, uh, for us are greenfield and brownfield residential, institutional, commercial and industrial wastewater conveyance installations. Any building that supports roof mounted or building integrated PV panels. Our system is installed in a residential subdivision, a college campus in Sudbury, Ontario, and it is currently installed in a uh, 55 unit seniors residence also outside of uh, Sudbury, Ontario. You see examples on those pictures. Next slide, please. The uh, benefits of the AdSource energy technology is first, uh, wastewater infrastructure is dual purpose as the thermal energy sink while it continues its liquid convey waste conveyance function. The heat exchanger does not come into contact with sewage and does not impede the liquid flow. The sewage pipe is maintenance free over the lifespan of the pipes. Uh, pipes have a minimum lifespan of 50 years. Uh, we know of some in New York City that are over 120 years. So this is the expected life expectancy of the uh, heat exchanger in the sewage pipes. Second, wastewater pipes will be used irregardless. Using them to store and recover heat can pay for new or the replacement of wastewater infrastructure. It reduces or eliminates the need for geothermal wells and for the hybrid panels. For each unit of electricity, a hybrid a photovoltaic panel produces over two units of thermal energy, with the same footprint. Hybrid PV panels can be roof or ground mounted or building integrated. Removing heat from panels increases uh, photovoltaic electrical generating efficiency on average by 5% per year. And if we have enough uh, regular solar panels on there, we have a uh, perfectly uh, uh, autonomous uh, system that can uh, survive any uh, outages on the grid and will function. Thank you very much for your attention. Nice job, Carl, and thank you so much for the presentation. As you noticed, um, at source energy kind of provide two technology. One is the pipe. Um, that's wrapped around the sewer system, no impedance on the sewage flow. And the other one is panel. And together they can provide a really nice off-grid solution and resiliency. The reason why we showcase this because we, we do think that our customer value the resiliency. And we'll talk more about these two solutions, how they can work in conjunction or separately. Um, but thank you for highlighting that for us. And uh, I believe last um, but not least, uh, participant is from Uhrik Group, um, Christian von um, Drakenfeld. Drakenfeld. Um, he's joining us from Germany and he's going to be showcasing also a sewage heat recovery system that is currently installed in many places in Europe and uh, have market in North America as well. 
Go ahead, Christian. Yeah, thank you very much, Sylvia. Sorry for the surname, <laughs> but thank you did very well. Thank you. Um, yeah, on, I have to say sorry that uh, my colleague Stefan uh, can't join you today. He, he catched a cold. He's actually our guy who would be looking into the US market. Has, has been there a couple of times. Um, uh, I'm responsible for the for our business development in Europe. So, but I hope I can share some insights uh, with you as well today. So, next slide, please. Um, yeah, I just want to uh, explain what, what's our idea. Right? Our general idea is that we want to uh, tap the energy that is in the public sewer system. And we are looking for a, a simple system. Uh, and this is um, how we are thinking it, it should look like. It is, um, uh, it is a stainless steel heat exchanger system that is installed module by module in the sewer pipe. And um, then it is connected to a heat pump with a feed and return pipe. Um, the heat transfer medium in the primary circuit is uh, running through the heat exchanger in the sewer pipe. I think this is, um, yeah, you all understand the, how it works. And um, the idea is to uh, supply building complexes or heat networks that are in rather close proximity to the sewer pipe. Uh, this could still be a couple of hundred meters. It always depends on the size of the project, on the energy demand. Of course, if you have a huge energy demand, it, it is as well economical viable if you if you go for a longer connection line to the to the to the heating center to the heating pump uh, to the heat pump yeah and our um, uh, so that's that's our solution we install these modules directly in the sewer and we always say this system is a passive system as I said it's it's just a stainless steel heat exchanger that we uh, are producing we are designing it producing it installing it uh, ourselves usually. Uh, and it's always tailor made. Um, uh, it's, it is uh, adapted to the to the sewer shape and, of course, to the specific project to the energy demand. And you can see on the bottom that we've got like basically two types of different models we can use um, uh, modules we can use type A, type B. Well, this is um, when there is a specific project, we will decide what what's best for this project. Next slide, please. Um, so, what is um, what are we focusing on? What are what are usually our clients? Well, uh, I think this has been said before by, by other um, companies here as well, that we are looking at buildings, let's say 20 residential units uh, plus, uh, so we will not do it for a single home. But uh, if you have some larger building complexes, um, this, this could be a, a good project. Um, and we are supplying heat networks as well with this technology. Um, of course, these can be residential or for commercial use. This, uh, this, is, uh, this is clear. and. Um, well, yeah, we are preferably we are in the low temperatures uh, in the heating system here. Uh, this is not to say that we haven't uh, supplied um, even heat networks that are running on higher temperatures right now in Europe. We've got a lot of issues with these high temperature networks that uh, that people think how to get down temperatures a bit. And sometimes this even works that we can supply with this technology, these higher temperature networks as well. What we are offering to our clients is that we, um, yeah, we, we, design, uh, produce, and install our heat exchanger system turnkey. And if uh, it's an opportunity, if there's a, the project um, is, is suitable for that, we can as well look into, we can be part of a heat supply contract as well, together with a partner. Uh, this, this is an idea as well, of course. What, what's our track record? I mean, I think this is, we have been in operation for 15 years now, um, and we have uh, installed more than 120 plants. They are in operation. We have a lot of experience with them, how they are working, uh, how they are performing. So I think this is one of our strengths. Um, I invite all of you to look at our website where you can find a list of references of the projects that we have done to as well get an idea about the size of the uh, plants we're doing, starting from maybe just 50 kilowatts up to, uh, of course, a couple of megawatt systems. Uh, yeah, next final slide, please. Um, maybe just again, the question was, what's our unique selling point? We are saying, yeah, it's an eternal solution. You don't need any external space, uh, which is especially in densely populated areas and urban city centers, often an issue. Uh, no additional costs for extra space. Uh, what I might add here as well, no digging is usually needed because we enter with our modules through the manholes um, when we're installing the system. Uh, this is, of course, in many cities, it is an advantage because no one wants, wants a lot of roadblocks there. Um, and as I said, it's a passive system, low maintenance. Um, uh, maybe just some cleaning a couple of years with a high pressure cleaner, usually a heavy rainfall when we'll do the cleaning as well. That's it. And um, yeah, what we are thinking now, of course, about as well is that it is a stainless steel system. It can be recycled. It can be reused. This is um, something when it comes to renewable energy technologies, 
we think is important to consider now um, because we are installing these plants for let's say 20 30 40 years and uh, we need to think about what are we going to do with them once they are maybe deinstalled or not used anymore um, and why why Uric, why you should maybe talk to us uh, is that we yeah we have 120 plants in operation for some 15 years now we've got a lot of experience there and um, we, yeah, we are a bit proud that we have been successful in a highly competitive environment already during the last 15 years where gas was so much cheaper. Uh, and we, we have, yeah, nevertheless implemented all these projects in Europe. Um, and our whole production is running entirely on PV. Um, we have 55 years of experience as a company, as the URIC group in the wastewater sector. Actually, our mother company is, is doing sewer construction and repairs, maintenance and so on. So we know what is important for the water companies um, when tapping energy from wastewater. And um, yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot for, for the Urban Green Council and for Con Edison for inviting us here to be among so many innovative companies. That's great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Christian. Great presentation, great overview. For those who haven't noticed yet, the reason why we put eSource, Pipe Energy and Ulrich next to each other because they provide very a similar but different solution at the same time. If you have a um, need to replace your sewer system, whether it's a large multifamily complex or whether it's the district um, um, sewer system, um, replacement is done by eSource and in, in situ um, installation is done by um, URIC. So there are almost two different approaches. Um, they both accomplishing same thing by um, extracting the heat from, uh, from the water. So um, we talk about a lot of different options. We did talk about a lot about wastewater recovery, but there's a lot of options on waste heat recovery and many waste heat recovery outside the water are solutions that you're probably already familiar with the data centers and, and, um, and um, you already might have implemented, but we're happy to talk about it as well. So at this point, we're gonna take it to the Q&A. We're doing actually great on time. I have some questions prepared for panelists and I'm gonna start uh, diving through the Q&As. Um, if you would like to all panelists, just turn on back your cameras. And, and um, yeah, first of all, thank you so much. Everybody did great on time. And we're gonna start with a first question, I think for Shark. Um, and I'll combine the audience question with some of my questions and we go from there. So feel free on the audience side, type in, in your questions. I can see them. I'll start from top. Um, so on, on shark heat pump, the Piranha system, what do you anticipate Brock to be a challenge on implementing it specifically in New York? city or New York state, what challenges you're anticipating with implementations of the shark system? And I'm gonna uh, dial it with the question from David, what are the minimum temperature wastewater should be in order to Piranha to have um, be effective? And what are the typical wastewater sources? Perfect. So the first, uh, answer to the first question uh, regarding challenges. And I think uh, Christian had a, a good answer for this as well. Urban centers are tight areas. Um, so ensuring that you have uh, enough available space for any piece of equipment that's going to go into, whether it's a building or into a, you know, a district energy or a larger uh, commercial space um, and accessing the wastewater. So uh, for everyone here, we can't do what we want to do without having the ability to utilize the wastewater that's available. So access and, uh, and space, especially in, in city environments, are, are one major consideration. Regarding temperatures, uh, the piranha is able to pull wastewater down to about 41 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, so roughly 5 degrees Celsius uh, for everyone who's doing conversions. Um, we really can pull that temperature down as low as possible and still utilize as much of that heat um, before it, it, uh, it needs to just be discarded. Uh, we simply don't want to approach freezing. Uh, you don't want to have a an ice pop uh, in your, your sewer system, <laughs> basically. Uh, and sorry, Sylvia, what was the, oh, the, sorry, the final question uh, was regarding uh, sewer source. Really, anything that you can think of, um, anything from multifamily family residential uh, through commercial applications. Uh, we have projects, of course, with multifamily. Uh, typically, wastewater temperatures start around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and we can take it all the way down. Uh, 
really anything that uses and throws away hot water throughout the day is a really perfect application. We look at um, pools and natatoriums, gyms, uh, you know, rec centers with a lot of shower usage, commercial kitchens uh, that are uh, utilizing a lot of hot water, uh, hospitals, hospitality. Uh, again, we kind of run the gamut, especially because of the scale that we have from individual building all the way up to multi megawatt district energy systems. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I do see more question on sharks. So let's just finish that topic. So um, you did mention, obviously, one of the challenges, the way installation of the waste uh, water tank, finding a space space is always going to be a problem in New York City. Um, here is a question on um, anticipated installation cost and payback, mm -hmm. and also a question for, um, for the Piranha, the shark provides storage tank storage tank and I just lost it um storage tank and um air handling units or just heat pump along uh so we have a, a really fantastic rep in New York City uh called Highmark they would provide uh some of these auxiliary components for you uh, we at Shark are an OEM and we provide the uh, the equipment itself um so things like uh, we generally also don't work with uh, air source uh, heat pumps or air handling units however uh one variation of the piranha is a dual source heat pump that can also pull uh, energy from an ambient uh, cooling application so uh, something like a fan coil or an AHU so uh, I would uh, definitely recommend touching base with our local rep and uh, and seeing what they can do uh, not only on equipment but also assessing uh, payback and ROI for your projects it's highly variable as I'm sure everyone else on the panel um, will attest uh, really depending on local market conditions you know utility rates etc. Great. And um, just to emphasize the point, Piranha unit is wastewater heat pump, but it's provide heating. Um, they have a version of HC that provide heating and cooling. So, which is great as by nature of the heat pump. Um, the next question is for anybody from audience, uh, from the panel, I'm sorry, whoever feel comfortable answering it. Can you speak how your system might help or hurt CD white wastewater management processes? Um, I believe everybody going to talk about how they may help, but feel free to also um, be objective and mention the, the plus and minuses. So who would like to take that one? I, I could start, Sylvia. So in, in particular, uh, having dealt with a lot of municipalities uh, uh, globally, uh, the big concern that sewer operators and, and wastewater treatment operators are always concerned about is one, what is the temperature going back? Uh, to the wastewater treatment plant as they don't want to affect the anaerobic digestion process. Two, are you going to affect the flow in the sewer and potentially cause any blockage in the sewer? And then three uh, is, are you going to affect the, the composition of the wastewater itself? Again, Uber being a, a, a equipment manufacturer and supplier to uh, wastewater treatment plants to take that all into account. We screen it out, but put it back in in its same form. Uh, the wastewater temperature itself, typically we look at a five degree approach. Uh, so we take out about five degrees. We can go lower. The magic number that I've heard in, in industry is at, uh, I believe it was about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Anything below that, you impede anaerobic digestion back at the treatment plant. So when you're dealing with people like DEP, those end up being critical questions and, and making sure that you're going to comply with what they, they want to see. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, there is a follow-up question on that. What if any measurements or estimates exist for the quantity of thermal energy that is uh, transported in New York City sewer system? I think that will be a better question for DEP. I don't have a good an idea, but I do know that like two thirds in general um, waste energy is being um, energy that is being produced is wasted, but specifically in New York City sewer system, anybody has that statistics, est estimates for quantity of thermal energy transported? I, I don't have a statistic for, the, for New York, but I recently Thames Water for London, for instance, they, they released a report and they are claiming that there are 10 terawatt hours of um, energy from wastewater within their sewer infrastructure. Um, maybe this is a good figure. Yeah, and I think important part of what mo most, I think all of the technology presented that are interacting with your system, they do not necessarily change uh, the mass flow rate. They only simply extract the BTU 
and bring the same patch of flow rate into the system. So overall mass flow rate of the system doesn't change and the amount of BTU that is subtracted depend on the size of the project may not be necessary. Uh, it's, it's relatively probably negligent, negligent for overall system, but that's certainly a good question and something that had to be worked out with the EP. Okay, great. Um, next question for Carl uh, Newbert. Carl, please explain how the sewage energy pipe function as a thermal battery. Yeah, that's basically a, um, a, a continuation of what uh, Stephen was saying. Um, we not only uh, extract energy from the effluent, but we extract energy from the pipe around from the pipe around the uh, from from the from the pipe and the ground around the pipe and we store energy in that pipe as well in the summertime we heat up the pipe and the ground and in the wintertime we cool down the pipe and the ground thereby we have an extra uh, uh, factor to uh, to uh, for the pure exchange the uh, uh, majority of, uh, of of other companies here only use the effluent, whereas we use the entire surface area, outside surface area of the pipe as a uh, geo exchange medium. So that allows us to store and uh, recover energy from the from the pipe and the ground around it. Mm -hmm. It's essentially always holding energy is a question of the delta T around it. Correct. That and provide the, the storage. Yeah. And I think follow up from Ron on that call is that, is there a type A use for attaching around the outside diameter for the waste pipe inside the building? It is, our, our heat exchanger is in, embedded inside the walls of the pipe. It's encased in the concrete. So it's not on the outside. So it is actually in the, in the concrete. So it never touches any of the uh, effluent. It doesn't impede the flow of the, of the effluent and uh, it lasts as long as the uh, the pipes last so there's nothing on the outside it's all within the walls of the of the concrete in the pipe right and this is why um it requires a new installation the new pipe comes already with with the heat exchanger inside right Correct? and uh, new york city for example there are 70 miles of pipe either laid new every year or replaced so there is a tremendous uh, opportunity to uh, harness that energy that is moved uh, through the pipes and also use that as an energy storage uh, medium, those those new pipes. So that, right. that allows us to do- As long as you can work. align with the capital improvement schedules for New York City, it's a great underground storage. So we don't have a, we don't have a space concern as much as we have on the, uh, on, on the inside the building, although there's a lot of pipes underground in New York City as well. So that's something to and the, and the new pipes can help pay for the uh, in, installation of the new pipes because you charge an energy fee, energy usage fee for those pipes. Right. So you, have you use a, the pipes to pay for new infrastructure. Yes, you have a very interesting uh, business model on that one. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Carl. The next next question comes for for um, Ulrich. We know you have a very uh, established European presence. Do you have, um, do you all have reports in U.S. projects? Well, we, we don't have any projects yet in the United States, but I mean, we're working on some of these projects. We hope to, to have them some there soon. We have colleagues over in the United States who are working on these projects. So um, right now, all our projects are in Europe, but uh, I think some of the conditions where we have uh, implemented projects like uh, like in Citrix, like in Paris, in, in Vienna, in Berlin, and so on. This this very much relates to the situation you can find as well in large U.S. cities. So we are very confident that uh, it can work there as well. And we had some very good talks with water companies so far, uh, which is at least at what we believe is still always the key. Huh? If the water company is not willing to uh, um, discuss this topic, if they if they say, well, this, nothing will happen to my sewer network then nothing will happen. So it's always important to win them for the for these projects. Thank you. And in, in a role of innovation, often we do bring technology from international already ad adapted technology to our US market and, and the demonstration and to facilitate demonstrations obviously require collaboration with uh, many uh, partners and stakeholders. The next questions, it's, it's more of a comment. It will be great if the case studies for each technology can be shared 
for each technology along with the slides. This recording, this webinar is actually posted in Urban Green Council website. And I believe the deck slide will be posted along or if not, we'll let you know. Okay. Um, next question. Um, many years ago, MTA proposed heat heat extraction from the millions of gallons of water pumped daily from the tunnels of New York City subway system. I always thought that's also a great source of heat uh, recovery. Has any progress been made on exploring subway waste heat in New York City? Great question, Bob. Would subway waste water be a good resource for nearby ter thermal energy network? Well, this is a really good question. Um, on recovery of the heat from a New York City subway. It's also tied with the thermal energy network, which we will not talk about during this webinar. We're happy to probably facilitate in future maybe webinars on that. Um, any of your technologies are able to connect with the thermal energy networks uh, with, with the New York City subway heat recovery? We, uh, we've been following we've been following uh, some studies in Europe. Somebody recently did his PhD on geo exchange and tunnels in Europe, and uh, our technology could easily be adopted to a uh, subway tunnel instead of a sewage uh, pipe. We can wrap it inside the walls of a of a subway uh, tunnel and use that for heating and cooling of the tunnel and uh, recuperating the uh, the energy. That's there. Great. On Con Edison side, the answer is we are we are not engaged directly with MT at this point because we don't have preliminary design that would include their waste heat. We are currently designing um, any new project with NTA areas um, uh, of this first wave of pilot. Obviously, the thermal energy networks in, in works in RFP stage. Oh, nothing we can comment further on that. Okay. Um, so, Carl, you did mention it could be recovered through waste, um, the subway systems, right? You can you can have adapted to the New York City subway. Yeah, you you you, you can do what you can put a uh, heat exchanger in the uh, the concrete walls of a subway tunnel, and it functions the same as a uh, as a uh, sewage pipe. Uh, you can store energy uh, in the pipe, or you can extract it from it. So. Whichever way the uh, whatever you have to do is you can have that done. Have it was it done before in any metropolitan city? This type of heat exchange instead of sewer water and and the ambient and ground um, we're, ground we're, system uh, would be between the air. We we're, 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 uh, somebody did his PhD on uh, tunnels in Europe, using uh, using tunnels uh, to for for geo exchange, and that's the same principle as uh, what we're using for uh, for our three. Okay, so you would require to incorporate it into the walls of tunnels instead Correct. of instead of wall of the sewer system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just put it in the wall of the you know inside the wall of the uh, the, the concrete wall of a uh, of a, uh, a subway tunnel or or or, or a, 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 a you know a subway tunnel. And it would work the same way. Uh, that that is actually interesting um, way of applying the technology and thinking outside the box and. I really like that. Um, Carl, one more question back to you. I also have one for you after that. Um, what are the advantages, what advantages does your sewer heat recovery system have to function as a district energy system? Uh, In other words, can yeah. it function as a district energy we, system? We can act as the, uh, the backbone of a fifth generation energy system because we can connect uh, our pipes uh, uh, and, and link them link each heat exchanger from one pipe to the next and we can extend it as long as uh, as, as the installation is so if it's a brand new installation like we're uh, uh, working with right now in Colorado a 14,000 uh, unit uh, de uh, sub, sub uh, um, development uh, for for 14,000 houses and, and the uh, sewage pipes would act as the uh, backbone of a uh, of a fifth generation uh, energy system so the sewage pipes would be the uh, the links between the uh, nodes that are attached to it. Each house becomes a node that produces and uh, consumes energy. So we are basically the, the the continuum between them. I really like the the terminology of fifth uh, fifth um, generation of energy. I really don't think about waste heat as as a commodity, as as we start thinking of it right now and renewable energy as well. 
So uh, it's interesting way how you sort of close the loop and, and bring the customers to um, almost a full energy uh, recovery mode. And in, in that sort of thought process, I also wanted you to ask question, how can the panels, e-source panels be separated from e-source pipe? And for those who don't have ability to make the decisions on incorporating new pipe in the sewer system, can they at least leverage of the heat that is generating in back of the solar panels and how they can incorporate that solution independently from the e-source pipe? Uh, connecting uh, the uh, hybrid panels via heat pump to a uh, uh, warm water tank, you can heat up as much warm water as you, as you require and then use that uh, throughout the year. And in the wintertime, when it snows and uh, when, it, uh, uh, when you have snow or ice build up, you reverse the cycle, you, cool, you, you heat up the panels and you prevent uh, snow and ice from building up so you can continually produce electricity. The, uh, uh, the panels, if you integrate them in those concrete sound barriers that are along highways, you can uh, harness the energy that comes, you can dual purpose these, these sound barriers by producing electricity and also heat for the uh, adjacent uh, properties. So you have another opportunity to use the, uh, the, the space that's already uh, occupied by the panels and produce for each unit of electricity, two units, more than two units of uh, thermal energy. So you're making, uh, you, you're, you're recuperating a lot more than what you're doing with uh, solar panels alone. Would you provide the solar panels or would it be adapted with the customer's existing solar panels? We license, uh, solar, um, we license installers of solar panels with the technology to 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 pr to produce those uh, those panels on site or if, within New York City, so we, we would have a somebody in New York City to produce the the pipes. Okay. We would have somebody in New York City to produce the panels. Now that's a great example of waste heat recovery, the the heat that is generated on the back of the panels, and use that for exchange for providing your preheating of domestic hot water. Talking about domestic hot water, question for Patrick. What is really the value of extracting the heat from condensate while preheating domestic hot water? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, um, <clears throat> some application might be um, difficult to have a good ROI depending on the building process. You know, sometimes it's just a faucet for washing hands and some showers here and there. So it won't have a demand. So we'll need like a big buffer tank. The big advantage to uh, use this on our vertical flooding design is since we are flooding the heat exchanger, there's no flash team coming out of the condensate. So the heat exchanger will last more longer. It will be really a water to water heat exchange there to, upon your load. So of course, if we cool down the condensate too much because the set point is too low, things of that nature, there's no such needs, but as long as the condensate stays between, I will say, 90 to 130 Fahrenheit, it's a good application uh, to use uh, a heat recovery. Just want to add also, um, I know there's some misconception about steam and not being so green. I, uh, the, the beauty of using steam energy is uh, the district energy generation can be generated for any other future fuel in the future and all the buildings that are using steam suddenly will become green if they use green steam so in a long-term perspective i think it, yeah so thank uh, you so. yeah and and conet steam distribution steam district system is also uh, working their way to complete the Absolutely. yeah thank you for that there's a lot of questions so let's go through that thank you uh, patrick uh, another question is coming about the, uh, can any of these heat conservation technology be used as a sustainability in low and um, medium, a middle income setting in terms of cost implementation maintenance versus saving long terms? So let's focus on the LMI. It's in the core stone of the CLCPA. What, what can you guys offer for all your LMI markets? Well, I think the Piranha would uh, would be one option um, installed directly into a, a multifamily uh, project, uh, housing, you know, all sorts of different demographics, uh, recovering their energy. And uh, of course, as it is a heat pump, it has a, a pretty significant COP. Um, so I think that would be one really great option. Great. 
Yes, um, especially for decarbonize, decarbonizing domestic hot water. Mm -hmm. um, question about the control system. Does any of your system require sort of sophisticated or proprietary computer control system? Additionally, does, does there need to be strong coordination between building, utility, and city agencies to operate these systems at scale? I assume this is more for ERIC or e-source, but maybe in general, once it's behind meter, it's probably within the building control, but I'll let you um, please volunteer to answer the question. Yeah, we, say, I mean, we, oh, sorry, go ahead. Please, go ahead, go ahead. I, I just wanted to say our, our system is quite simple in that sense. I mean, we, we just have the heat exchanger. It's connected to the heat pump. And then, of course, the heat pump and the whole heating system, this is usually a, a bit more of a sophisticated system, which we actually, we don't do this. We, we usually are just cooperating with those companies or with those engineers that are doing these systems. But I think in general, our system can be considered to be rather simple and not too complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we behind the meter there is no problem. But uh, if it's uh, on uh, on sewage uh, pipes that are owned by uh, a, a city or so on, uh, you have to get the city on site to uh, lease out those uh, those pipes or to operate them on behalf of uh, the uh, the city to to, to to charge for these for the use of it. And uh, we're in discussions with uh, uh, the city of New York to do that. Uh, to your previous question, um, we've applied for a, a UTEN uh, uh, grant uh, to have a low-income, uh, affordable uh, housing uh, prod complex in in Harlem uh, uh, to be decarbonized. So there are efforts out there that you know we're looking at uh, the uh, disadvantaged communities that are targeted by these uh, various laws. Great, that that's definitely the market we focus as well. A um, few more questions. We're doing great with time. We'll take another five minutes of answering questions or so, and then we'll um, move to close out. Obviously, I encourage you to type question. We may follow up um, after that uh, with the questions that were not answered. All right, let's keep going. Um, about Piranha system, um, does the Piranha system uh, being independent standalone system or do does it require any clearance from New York City DEP? I'm going to um, take a start on that and then Brock, you may elaborate. We believe that currently because it's behind the meter application, only the DOB will be doing review. And if DOB feels it's necessary, the DEP will be included in uh, the permitting or, or um, um, certification. But certainly behind meter application falls within jurisdiction of the DOB and DEP is involved as needed. Brock, would you like to add anything to that? I think that was perfect uh, because it's part of a building inf infrastructure, not city infrastructure. Um, I would agree, DOB versus uh, DEP. Uh, I think that was perfect. <laughs> okay, great. Um, next question. Um, Okay, uh, the, the, the city of London, UK provides heat map showing where there is demand for thermal energy as well as excess energy available. Great. Does New York City have similar heat pump or plans to develop one? I believe this will be really outside the panelist question. It's really great question because maybe more for Urban Green Council. <laughs> But uh, we might want to answer that separately because it's more of a city planning question. But does anybody or Sean or Urban Green Council, do you guys have an answer for that? Uh, if not, we may want to follow up on that separately because I don't know if there's any plan for that. But it might be. It, might, it will be a great way to inform, I guess, the panelists where the heat source is an opportunity to tap in. Okay. Um, will this presentation be available later to access? Um, I, I already mentioned I, the recording will be posted. Um, well, presentation will be avail available. I guess with permission of the panelists, we may make it available. Um, I'll let Urban Green Council um, answer that as well, but I don't think reason why not. Okay. Um, 
Great. Keep coming. We have maybe one or two time, but I went through most of the question. I believe I went through all the question, which is great. I do have uh, one more question myself um, for um, for uh, Ulrich about the STEAM hybrid solutions. So how do you anticipate, um, I'm sorry, this was for Maxiterm. <laughs> um, pa Patrick, um, with hybrid electrification, you know, like there's a big focus on electrification. STEAM obviously is, is a pathway to assume it. How do you see your system um, incorporated with um, electric heat pumps? How do you see operation of the building working in conjunction with a heat pump? Would you base load with heat pump and peak with a steam? And does your equipment fits within that role of operation or vice versa? Uh, I think absolutely yes. I don't see any reason why. Like I said earlier, I mean, there's a misconception about steam that's being used to make hot water at 180 Fahrenheit which it was the case multiple, many, many years ago, I mean. So today, I mean, if we need to do 100 Fahrenheit set point, 90, 120, I mean, everything is feasible. So yes, absolutely, to answer your question. And just that you know, I answered manually a couple, two questions in the Q&A box, and I think it landed in the answered box. So just want to let you know. Okay, perfect. It's um, great. I can see that. Um, Okay, very good. Um, one more question for Ulrich and keep typing questions. If you have any last burning question, we did allocate until 1130, uh, but I'd be happy to give you back your time. Um, can you explain some of your current projects um, or, or upcoming development um, that you're very excited about? Yeah, well, thanks. Um, well, we're excited that we will have a project uh, starting next month, really in the city center of Berlin. Um, this is an old building that has already been uh, built uh, in the times of the German Democratic Republic, and they are now renovating it. And we will install a system there in the in two sewer sections that will uh, supply some 700 kilowatts of um, of heating. And in the summer, the same system can be used. Then reverse heat pump can be used for 700 kilowatts of cooling as well so we are very much looking forward to it it's uh yeah it's going to be a good good project thanks okay great well i'm gonna screen for see if there's a last questions here very nice and um okay so i just got confirmation from our green council that both recording and presentation will be available on the event page thank you for that um um there's a one more question i think i skipped and their drape is a startup with a panel that can be deployed in the subway system, I believe. Okay, so it's a comment. Great. Yeah, I, let's get that heat out of the subways, especially for summer. Um, guys, you're very innovative thinking outside box. I really like the fact that we highlight some solutions that we didn't even discuss as a primary product. So like uh, Carl mentioned on the R3C side that we can actually work with many different heat sources. So um, I do want to thank every single panelist and the audience for very engaging questions and for very engaging and um, concise presentations. I want to thank Urban Green Council for providing platform for us to showcase technology and connecting um, um, technology provider with the market itself. It's obviously there was a lot of interest in your technology. That means that there might be some possibilities for installations and follow ups. You will see their contacts are posted on the chat and they will be also posted um, on the event site and also it's being shared on the screen right now. So feel free to reach out directly to um, individual technology providers. On Shark, we have a local um, tech rep, um, Aaron Miller, in addition to uh, Brock Trimble, who was presenting and the rest of the contacts are the same as the presenters. Um, yes, yeah, so I just want to conclude to the fact that we are at the at the age of at the era that every BTU counts and every CO2 and greenhouse gas emission that could be saved should be saved. 
it, it is not only socially responsible, but it's also costly responsible. So we as an individual building um, tenants or, or order owners or utility, we all play a role in accomplishing this. And we should be tapping in, in the most innovative technologies out there, such as the one we showcase in, in the industry of waste heat recovery and outside to do anything possible to reduce our um, CO2 footprint. Um, with that saying, um, thank you again for the panelists and for the um, audience to ask questions. We hope you will reach out to not only the tech providers, but to Con Edison as, as itself to work more with us on project and collaboration with partnership on R&D. And we're always happy to de-risk technology and provide ability to do either feasibility study or de demonstration projects and then move it along to the um, to the stage where the inset the measures can be incentivized from the clean heat program as a prescriptive or custom measure. So happy to talk to you individually a few in the future. And I would like to just hand it back to Ellen at this point, um, who she will um, go over the upcoming events and just explain what's coming up great from Urban Green Council House. Thank you, Sylvia. That was fantastic. That was such an interesting event. So we have a few upcoming events we'd like you to know about. We have um, an event we're calling Financing Energy Upgrades 101 to just give the lay of the landscape for how to finance all these energy projects. And then we have our spring member reception on March 15th and anyone is welcome to come and meet Urban Green members and network. Those are great events. You can register for everything at urbangreencouncil.org slash events. Thank you again to Sylvia. That was fantastic, uh, fantastic event. Sylvia really was the um, engine behind the whole thing. And Sean also for bringing the, the idea for the event to us. And thank you all to the speakers for sharing such interesting information. As we mentioned, this episode will be available on our website and podcast streaming platforms shortly. Thank you for attending and have a great day. Thank you.